afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Lee, and I'm a principal bioinformatics architect with Amazon Web Services. First, I want to thank you for taking the time to join me today. Um, in this talk, I wanted to cover some of the core concepts for building scalable genomics data analysis using the cloud. But before we begin, uh, I think it's important to understand what the challenges are in genomics when it comes to data analysis. So let's take a look at this chart. Uh, this chart shows how much it costs to generate a whole human genome uh, from the years 2001 to just last year in 2019. Um, what's started as something that uh, mirrored Moore's law has rapidly accelerated to the point where the cost of genomic sequencing is at or below $1,000 and making it much more widely accept, uh, accessible. And so globally over about $4 billion has been appropriated to population sequencing initiatives to better understand genetic risk factors and contribute to population health. And it's estimated that over 60 million individuals are expected to have their individual genome sequenced in a healthcare setting by the year 2025. So ultimately, what that means is that the amount of genomics data generated each year outpaces that from other fields that you'd think of traditionally as, as large, such as astronomy or social media or video content. And if you look closely, um, you'll see that the footprint of genomics data is expected to grow annually by, uh, in, on the scale of etabytes. So when it comes to processing genomics data or, or running genomics workloads, there are a couple of key considerations. Uh, first is the size of genomics data. It can be, uh, there are multiple types of genomics data. You can have whole genome sequencing, you can have whole exome sequencing, you can have targeted panels. The size of the data can range uh, on the order of tens of gigabytes to hundreds of gigabytes per sample. Uh, and the amount of data, as I showed before, is rapidly growing because of continuous uh, improvements in the sequencing technologies. Second uh, is the compute required to process that data. So there are many steps linked uh, that are used together to process genomic data from its raw form into a scientifically usable uh, form. And there are a lot of tools involved and each one of those have varied computational needs depending on the genomic data type and, and tool that, uh, that is involved. So in short, one does not simply process whole, whole genomic sequencing data on their laptop. So how can the cloud help? Well, the level set, I think it's uh, important to kind of talk briefly about what the cloud is. So cloud service providers like AWS provide four fundamental services that enable um, all other services at, at, uh, and infrastructural agility. So first of all is compute. So uh, with Amazon, you have uh, Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. You can think of these as cloud-based virtual machines. There's uh, storage, so things like um, block storage, like Amazon Elastic Block Store, EBS, or object store uh, storages uh, like Amazon S3, and identity and, and access management. So in AWS, this is AWS IAM. And then these, uh, these three fundament, fundamental uh, services are then used and cobbled together to create higher level services or managed services. Um, things like AWS Batch or uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service, which I'll talk about a bit later in this talk. Another important fact is uh, the cloud is globally distributed. And so if you look at AWS's global infrastructure, uh, it has present in 24 geographically isolated regions. Each of these regions is comprised of multiple availability zones, and these availability zones are distinct but closely coupled data centers for a total of uh, 76 uh, availability zones worldwide. And it's important to note that this footprint is, is always constantly growing and increasing uh, at a pretty significant rate. And so, with all of this, what, what does the cloud provide? Well, it provides five things. So there's security. So at its core, AWS infrastructure is custom build, built and designed uh, to meet the most stringent security requirements in the world. Um, next, there's availability. Cloud infrastructure and services are designed for high, high availability. And applications that you build on the cloud can be spread across multiple AZs or multiple regions so that you, they are available to you and your customers. 
Um, next, there's performance. So AWS uh, offers low latency, low packet loss, and overall high network quality. Next is scalability. Cloud applications can dynamically scale uh, and grow to meet the needs of immediate demand or scale back. So that includes scaling up and scaling down um, as, as demands uh, against a cloud-based application uh, rise and grow, or rise and, and then decrease over time. And then finally, there's flexibility. So you can run your, uh, your applications or develop your applications where and how you need them. And all of this is uh, given to you um, at reasonable cost. So what you can think of the cloud as is more, more or less computing as a utility. So AWS provides you with computing services, kind of like you would think of like your local uti utilities, like, like the power company. So think of it like, like you would go to your home and you, could, you would turn on a light switch and the power comes flowing in. Um, you can think of uh, AWS and the cloud as providing computing in the same fashion. So what does that translate into? Well, that means that uh, computing infrastructure is available to you on demand and fit for your immediate needs. Um, you only have to pay, uh, pay as you go and pay for what you use. There, are, there aren't any upfront contracts to get started. Um, and also, uh, finally, you can focus on the applications uh, that you want to build and that differentiates uh, your workload from, uh, from everything else and not have to worry about managing the underlying infrastructure associated with it. So let's talk about how using the cloud applies to genomics data analysis, specifically workflow pipelines. So when we talk about genomics workflow pipelines, they, are, they typically look like something like this. So you, you start with your raw sequencing data, your A's, T's, C's, and G's, and you have a sequence of tools that you need to do to process, uh, you use to process them into uh, a form that you can start to interrogate and use for scientific or clinical um, action. Each of these tools um, expects a file in uh, file as input, and they generate a file as output. And each tool in this workflow is unique. Uh, some of them can be command line utilities. Others could be Python scripts. Others could be compiled, uh, like Java or C C++ programs. And so, under the underlying that is uh, that there are a lot of software dependencies to manage. Similarly, each tool has specific computational needs and performance profiles. So some of them may be compute bound, others will require lots of memory, and also parts of the pipeline may run quickly while others a little uh, more slowly. So this adds complexity as to how and when a tool in the workflow should be run. So when it comes to running your genomics data analysis and workflow pipelines, there are three major infrastructural components to, to consider. So first is data storage, uh, next is job execution, and uh, finally workflow orchestration. And we'll cover all of these in this talk. So let's start with data storage. So there are three aspects of storage to consider. Uh, first, you need durability. So ro a robust and accurate storage for both your active and archive data. Second is availability. You want to be able to access, have your data be easily available to you, to your collaborators, and to the compute resources that are that's going to operate on it, and finally, you want controlled accessibility or security. Um, genomics data is arguably is the arguably the most sensitive type of data. It, in fact, it's it's a person's biological source code, so you would want you'd expect the highest amount of security around it. And so, for these three reasons, um, I would argue that cloud object storage, like Amazon S3, provides the easiest way to store with 11 nines of durability. Uh, and securely share data. Um, and as a highly available resource, it can provide a cloud-native single source of truth for your data-heavy applications. So let's talk about how you, how you run workflows, um, specifically all of the individual jobs within a workflow. And so if you uh, take a step back, there are kind of a couple ways that you can think about to, to run a workflow. The first is to um, take your workflow and run it entirely on a single compute node that is, uh, that is scaled for the biggest job in your workflow. Or what you can, and I would argue that this is a more scalable way to do this, is to split up your workflow into individual tasks and distribute those tasks onto smaller compute instances that are more fit for, uh, fit for purpose and fit for size for, that, for the task at hand. 
And so we're going to walk through this model of running workflows um, uh, uh, for, for DNA analysis. So if you kind of zoom in on one of these tasks, uh, the basic processing pattern looks like this. So you'll have your raw data that's stored um, in object store, so like an Amazon S3 bucket. Um, you'll have a compute node that is like an Amazon EC2 instance, like a Linux server, um, with an attached uh, EBS uh, volume as a hard drive. And on this compute node, you will have uh, the, a specific tool installed on it. <clears throat> and so you'll take the inputs from an S3 bucket, you'll place it on, you'll stage it onto this compute node. The tool will do its job, uh, process that, that raw data into an output, and then that output is returned uh, back to an S3 bucket. And so for each step of a workflow pipeline, this, uh, this pattern repeats itself. And so what's important is you want to be able to use your, uh, each of the computing resources as efficiently as possible. And so <clears throat> you'll, you'll probably think about, well, I want to try to place as many uh, jobs as I can uh, uh, that are fit for that uh, compute node uh, to run in parallel. Um, the, you might run into challenges there where uh, you'll have dependency clashes. So in this case, we're looking at a tool here that requires, uh, say, NumPy 1.14 and another one that requires NumPy 1.18. Uh, and uh, you can't run these two tools at the same time because you, uh, you, could, you could run into um, dependency clashes with this li particular library. And so some of the best practices here is to isolate each, each of these tools from each other. Um, and uh, the recommended way to do this the, that is kind of promoted by the community is to use uh, Docker containers. So now if you containerize these two, two, two tools, you can run them simultaneously on this node, on this compute node, and not have to worry about dependency clashes between them. Second, you want to be able to uh, carve out this, uh, this computing instance to uh, fit the tool, the, the jobs that are running on it. So here I'm showing a tool here that requires a lot of CPU and a lot of memory. So 16 uh, CPUs, 64 gigabytes of, mem of memory. And then another tool that's also running simultaneously on it uh, that requires uh, about half of, of what, it, what the other tool requires. So you want to be able to carve this out with, uh, within this uh, compute instance. And then finally, you want to match each of these tools to the right compute instances. So here you have a uh, memory constrained uh, operation. You want to place that on a memory optimized uh, compute instance. So something like a, an R4 type uh, of instance from Amazon EC2. Um, and conversely, if you have something that's compute bound, you want to place that on a compute optimized uh, uh, instance. And so, what you can now do is you can take compute instances uh, and you can group them into logical clusters uh, or compute environments. And um, these compute environments can be based on either on-demand instances or if you are uh, cost conscious, you can use spot instances, which are spare uh, capacity in, uh, in AWS's cloud infrastructure. And then you can take all of the tools in your workflow and schedule them up in a job queue. And then you can use a service like AWS Batch to schedule these jobs onto the right compute instance uh, at, at the right time. And so now let's talk about kind of workflows as a whole. So workflows as a whole, they can be complex. As we talked about before, there are multiple tools involved. There are multiple paths within a workflow and there could be multiple outputs uh, in either intermediate or final from uh, within a workflow. And so this is where workflow languages help abstract the problem away. Uh, workflow languages like Whittle or CWL or Nextflow or even Amazon States language. And what they allow you to do is to distill the jobs of your workflow into their core comp components. So in particular, a container image, uh, the immediate compute re resources that that job requires, the command uh, or the task that that job uh, performs and the data inputs and outputs associated with that task. And then they also allow you to define the relationships between uh, those tasks. So either organized by, in, uh, by orders of steps or in most cases by uh, data dependencies between each task. And so 
if you wanted to assemble this whole picture together, what you do is you write your workflow definition uh, using one of these languages here. You would send that workflow to an orchestration engine that's specific to that language. So for Whittle, you'd send that to Cromwell. Uh, for Nextflow, you send it to Nextflow. For uh, Amazon State's language, you send it to um, Amazon AWS Step Functions. Um, and then you would have that, that engine would then integrate with something like AWS Batch to run those containerized jobs in a scalable way. And then finally, once uh, while this workflow is done or, or working, uh, it would uh, send all of its data to cloud object storage like uh, Amazon S3. So what do sample architectures look like? Well, let's start with this one. This is um, an AWS reference architecture for using AWS native services. Um, it uses AWS step functions as the workflow orchestrator. It uses AWS batch for job execution and it uses Amazon S3 for data storage. And what's important to note here in this architecture is that it's entirely service, serverless. What that means is that uh, the compute scales up as needed when running workflows and completely scales down uh, when the workflow is complete. And so there's no permanently running servers to, to manage with this, uh, with this architecture. Next, this is an example architecture that shows running Nextflow in AWS. And again, it's important to, to draw out some of the, the, the patterns here. So we have, uh, we are running Nextflow as a containerized job. So think of this as just as the orchest workflow orchestration layer. It is now also talking to AWS Batch uh, to, uh, for running individual processes within a, a Nextflow workflow. And again, data for, uh, from the workflow itself and uh, logs and session cache of the workflow are sent to, to, to Amazon S3. And so like the previous step function example, this architecture is also entirely serverless. Here, AWS Batch is handling all the scaling required to run uh, a Nextflow workflow, including the master process and the individual um, tasks in, in, in the workflow. And finally, here is something that's slightly more complicated. This is uh, an example of uh, architecture for running Cromwell on AWS. And the only difference here is that there's a small server, um, a small EC2 instance for the Cromwell uh, uh, executable to be running in server mode. Otherwise, everything else is roughly the same as what you saw before. Jobs are sent to AWS Batch um, for processing. The cache data here is being sent to uh, Amazon Aurora Serverless, uh, an Amazon Aurora Serverless database. And uh, data from the workflow and logging information is sent to Am Amazon S3. So what does this actually look like in real life? So here at, uh, this is an example from the Quantitative uh, Biology Center uh, in, at Tübingen, Germany, or, or Cubic. Um, it's a research center that's located at the University of Tübingen in Tübingen, Germany. Um, they moved their HPC environment and data management platform to the AWS cloud and Cubic now runs Nextflow and AWS for their workflow management using AWS Batch. Um, and they're able to efficiently um, run hundreds of thousands of batch computing jobs in the cloud. Um, using this, they, they can easily scale on demand, uh, be it processing 30 samples or 100,000 samples for one research project. And doing so, they were able to reduce the research and processing time by 50% for all of their, uh, all of their jobs. Uh, next, this is one of our newest uh, genomics use cases that, uh, that recently came out. Um, this is from the Fred Hutch uh, Cancer Research Institute. Um, here they were using Nextflow and AWS Batch, and uh, they had a project where they were processing 15,000 uh, biological samples, each about a gigabyte in size. And uh, using architectures that I described before, they were able to perform the equivalent of seven years of compute in just seven days. So there, there's certainly a lot more that I could cover, um, but unfortunately there isn't enough time in this talk to, to do so um, at great depth. So what I want to do is I want to leave you with a couple of parting thoughts and areas to explore on your own. So first, while your ar the architectures I showed you before uh, look, may look complex, you don't need to build them from scratch or manually. So workflow definitions, um, I, I'm, as I'm sure you know, are source code, and they can be version tracked and distributed using source code revisioning tools like Git. But it's important to know that you can also define your cloud infrastructure as code, 
and automate its deployment with services like AWS CloudFormation. And this makes it easier for you and your collaborators to reproduce uh, cloud, uh, cloud environments for processing genomics data. Also, the concepts and uh, services I covered are both uh, the most cloud native and also the most co cost optimized. But we here at AWS recognize that every customer is unique. And as such, there are plenty of options to choose from uh, to meet your specific needs. Uh, so for example, there are uh, many different workflow orchestrators to choose from. There are also many different ways to handle job execution, um, like using familiar HPC schedulers, using AWS Parallel Cluster, or using Kubernetes with Amazon EKS. And finally, there are also uh, different storage solutions that you can leverage, like NFS shares with Amazon Elastic File System, or high-performance par parallel file systems like FSx for Luster. And so I think the most important things that you should take away from this talk uh, at, about using the using AWS and in more in general, the cloud um, is that the cloud provides storage as a platform. Um, there are a broad spectrum of compute instances that you can leverage to process your, uh, your data um, as efficiently as possible. There are plenty of managed services for doing task execution, running analytics, doing machine learning. And finally, there are serverless and container-based uh, container architectures that allow you, that provide you uh, flexibility and agility. And so with that, I encourage you to explore more uh, and learn more about the cloud and AWS and how it can be used uh, for genomics. And so here are some extra resources uh, that you can use to get more details uh, about the architectures and concepts that we discussed today. Um, specifically, here is a prescriptive guide for uh, building and operating genomics workflows on AWS. And if you're looking for more, uh, we have blog posts and additional use cases that you can check out um, at our AWS genomics landing page. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have uh, uh, a great rest of your conference.